Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Datadog On. Datadog On is a video series where we interview people that work on Datadog, engineers, designers, product folks, to help share the interesting stories and give you some concrete takeaways about how you might apply some of the experience that they've earned to your own systems that you are building. I am Brandon West. I am a team lead on the developer advocacy side. And I am joined by a couple subject matter experts, people that have worked at Datadog for a long time and have a lot of experience working on design systems. So we'll kick it off with Vincent. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, yeah, I'm Vincent. I've been working in the web industry for about 13 years now, and I was hired in 2016 by Datadog to work on the APM product. Uh, I was one of the first people with like a clear front end uh, in the title. And now we're something like 300 contributors to uh, the front end code base. I'm very happy to be here. Derek, how about yourself? Yeah, hey, I'm Derek. Um, I am a staff product designer um, at Datadog. I started in 2015, so a little over eight years ago. Um, we were obviously a you know, much much smaller and different company then, which we'll, we'll definitely talk about here. Um, and I worked on a bunch of different stuff, including APM with Vincent. Uh, for a while when we were getting that sort of product off the ground and then transitioned into design systems and druids and I've been working on that um, here at Datadog ever since. So yeah, excited to be here. Excellent. Yes, uh, seven and eight years of tenure definitely qualifies you both as uh, veterans here at Datadog. I think you've been around longer than most of the company at this point. So very excited to have your experience here to help us tell the story about design systems and druids at Datadog. So a little bit about Datadog for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, Datadog is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps companies improve the observability and security of their infrastructure and applications. Uh, we have 25,000, over 25,000 customers at this point, millions of hosts, uh, billions of containers being monitored, and tens of trillions of events being sent to Datadog every day. So operating at a pretty significant scale at, at this point, which I think makes some of these technology decisions that we'll be talking about uh, more difficult and more interesting for sure. So before we kick it off, something I want to mention is that we do have Q&A that is open and we should have about 15 minutes at the end of this episode. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask, please do use the Q&A feature here in Zoom. We'll make sure that we get those questions asked and answered for you at the end of the session. So before we jump into how Datadog built a design system, it's good to provide a little bit of context and define what a design system actually is. So my not nuanced and naive perspective, not being a designer or no longer a front end engineer as well, uh, a design system is a collection of reusable components. It's guided by clear standards. And then those components are assembled together to build any number of applications or user experiences. But I know that both of you probably have a more informed and nuanced take when it comes to that definition. So Derek, what are your thoughts on the definition of a design system? I mean, I, I agree with that, with what you said. Um, it's that, and it's also, it's, it's, uh, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of, you know, uh, trying to, to make sure that designers, engineers, PMs um, are working towards, you know, shared goals and providing tools and, you know, components and literal code and, you know, tools for designers that help that help make that possible and help make that scale as your organization scales, as your, your product or your platform scales. Um, and it's, uh, I think, a, a way of thinking that uh, sort of tries to ensure that the whole of what you're building is greater than the sum of its parts. So, you know, making sure, and we'll, we'll, talk, we'll definitely talk about this more, but like Datadog is a platform. It's this thing it's, that's supposed to be interconnected um, in many ways and design system makes sure that you know, as you're sort of building more and more connections between different parts of the platform, that those things feel familiar to users um, and that you can build those things in a way that's uh, sustainable and, you know, uh, can evolve so that users continue to feel like it is truly a platform that's bigger than the, that's, you know, greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. Vincent, anything to add to that? Yeah. And it's, it's also, you know, the place where you record all of the design decisions that have been taken. So you will find inside of the design system, all of the decisions about typography, about color, palette, icons, layout, all of the things that we agreed upon mean something to us. And like, we want those decisions to, uh, to continue leading us to make great products. Cool. 
So the design system at Datadog is called Druids, and I, I love the logo. I, I love the acronym. I love the name. I love everything about it. But uh, Druids stands for a Datadog Reusable User Interface Design System. So a bit of a recursive uh, acronym there, but still, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, so one thing that's really cool about Druids, and uh, if, you, if you have time at the end of this session, uh, you can check out the docs. They've been published publicly. You can take a look at the component library and, and some of the design decisions that have been made at druids.datadoghq.com. So stay tuned for now. Don't go browsing away at the moment, but check it out later. It's very cool. It'll give you a sense of all the hard work that's gone into constructing this design system. So I want to talk a little bit about the origin of Druids at, at Datadog, how we got to where we are now, uh, sort of how things emerged over time. And I think something that's interesting is that, you know, Druids wasn't something that you envisioned at the beginning. It's not like you both set out to create a design system. Uh, I think, you know, that's a very difficult problem and it's hard to understand all of the different decisions you're going to have to make ahead of time without actually having uh, experience and working on small pieces of the system at, at a time. Um, and it wasn't necessarily something that was uh, a top-down mandate. There was no no one saying, hey, we need a design system. Go, go create one. Uh, so I think to talk a little bit about how this emerged organically, I, I don't know if either of you have anything to add to that, um, but there were a bunch of constraints as a startup becoming more of a platform that the front end engineer and design teams had to overcome in order to make this happen. So Vincent, can you talk a little bit about some of these constraints that you were dealing with? Yeah, for sure. And it's, you know, it's echoing uh, for a lot of um, what the web has been doing for the past 15 years. Um, in 2010, when Datadog starts, there's not a lot of, uh, of room for dynamic application to be made on the web. It's like you generate a web page somewhere in a server and you serve it. And then when somebody clicks, you generate another page and you serve it. And uh, somewhere around 2014, like we, we get Ajax and we get the modern like API calls that can be uh, integrated into, into your front end. And then you get richer app that starts to be built. So even when I arrived in 2016, like the web stack was there already, there was code that was working already. And so you can't just come in and say, oh, we're gonna change the whole technology about how we do front end development and we're not gonna do anything until like we figured it out. What we need to do is make sure that we can deliver something that brings value now. And also think about what is the thing that we want to do technically that is going to be safe for the future. What is something that I can do now that's going to help my fellow front-end engineers work faster, better, more productively? So we can't just like stop the machine and like do something different. We need to align ourselves with the philosophy of the company, which is basically like deliver something and then iterate on it. Like deliver something that you uh, you see will bring value and then like you can make it better, but always like in an incremental way. Jared, do you have a... Yeah, no, I mean, exactly. And like, I think the thing you said like a few minutes ago, Brandon, is is really important. Like there wasn't, we didn't have like, I think at a lot of companies when they go to make a design system, it's like, okay, uh, there's some sort of mandate to say like, you have to like, we, we're going to make a design system. So like, let's go do it. We're going to start from scratch and we're going to like, you know, kind of, we can do anything that we want. It, you know, we have a blue sky or green field or whatever, uh, whatever term you want to use. And, um, and it was just like, that's, that's not sort of the, the environment that we were in. Um, and uh, I think it was just like a recognition of the fact that, you know, Datadog was growing really fast, continues to, but like it was definitely growing really fast when we sort of started this, this endeavor however many years ago. And we recognized that it was going to continue to happen, that, that you know, we were just going to keep scaling. The platform was going to keep expanding. The number of people on it, the, working on it were going to keep expanding. And we just, yeah, we needed to sort of migrate um, from kind of the, the way that we had been doing things from a front end and a design standpoint, um, which weren't bad. And they worked really well and they worked for the scale that we started at. 
and they, they weren't going to work for the scale that we were going toward. And that was just like trying to just sort of make that decision and, and go for it. And the other thing just I wanted to add is, you know, you were saying you didn't, we didn't set out to, to, to create a design system. And I, like, I think that's true and it's not true. We, we sort of maybe naively in retrospect did try to st set out and say like, we want to make a design system at the beginning. And, and in retrospect, maybe we, we should have framed it a little bit different. Um, and, you know, you could go back and do certain things differently. Maybe you would do it differently. Maybe it would have been easier to get buy-in in certain ways if, if we had framed it differently. But in the end, it was just, you know, how, how can we help ourselves scale and, and evolve um, and do it so that, you know, our customers and our users are, are going to be um, well served as that keeps happening. So. Yeah, absolutely. Something that I think is, is really cool and th that I'd like to point out is that the decision was made to adopt React as a front-end framework in 2014, which means that Datadog was pretty early on in the adoption of that tool. I think it became publicly available in 2013, so started using it before the 1.0 release, which is really interesting. And I'm sure uh, that decision has has reverberated throughout the whole, the whole design system since then. All right, so now let's chat a little bit about how we dealt with some of those constraints and how you actually were able to do the work to get us to what is now called Druids. Yeah, so like the basic stuff that you need to do when you're starting that work is like realize basically that there's so many flavors of the same thing inside of the code base already. Like, oh, you want a button and there's like, very much a lot of different ways that you can put a button on the page, right? Um, and technologically, there's also like, okay, we have the web stack that we that we picked a long time ago, and where do we want to go technologically? And you mentioned like adopting React, um, but it's it's not as easy as saying like, oh, we're just going to go with React and just like replace everything, right? Like there's a period of uh, of uncertainty where two technologies live together, three technologies live together. And it's the same with simple things like buttons and drop downs and et cetera. Um, so when you, when you focus on, okay, like I want one button that people can use, like which one I'm, am I gonna pick? Like which is like the canonical button? How can I make it so that it supports all of those use cases? You start doing the inventories, right? Like you, you take the screenshot of all of those instances of that uh, UI and you're like, okay, I'm going to pick this. I'm going to like make this a use case of my button. There, those are going to be properties of the button that people can play with. And some of, uh, some of the things that exist, you're like, okay, maybe this is a unicorn and it's not going to be part of the button and we're just going to let, let it be on its own. Um, and so like in terms of how we did it, we had like, you know, a whole new app that we were building from the ground up. So like, it was very clear to us, like, of course, we're going to need those UI elements because we're repeating them here. And so it was a way for us to like build it for this new app, but also like validate that the use cases were correct. The new app being APM. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So before, before APM came along, I think there were probably like four major features of Datadog, which were the event stream, dashboards, metrics, and some uh, monitors on top of those things to alert the end users to certain things that were happening. So building this new significant piece of the platform was a great opportunity to take inventory and also make some design decisions. And I, I think it's interesting just, just when it comes to buttons to see <laughs> how many there actually were. And so this is a, a uh, bit of a hypnotic uh, animation, but showing all of the different ways that these various buttons were implemented, uh, similar buttons, different states of buttons, all of that stuff. And this is only a small slice. So that discovery and inventory process is not trivial at all. Yeah. And, and also, like, I think it's important to, to sort of say that having lots of different flavors of this kind of thing, whatever element or component or whatever, whatever that is, it's, having a lot of different flavors isn't inherently bad. It's not like, oh, well, we, we have like, you know, 40 of these and it's like in and of itself, it's bad. You know, it's not consistent or whatever. It's just that like, sometimes you have a lot of different flavors of something and they were sort of, uh, they kind of spun out of, you know, some intentional decisions and then some unintentional decisions or things got copied and tweaked a little bit. And, you know, some of them are, are different on purpose and some are different for no real reason. And it's like, the, you, it's, I think the act of sort of trying to define a design system is a lot of trying to capture 
what are what things are like different for a reason and what are those reasons and that's okay and what are things that are different for no reason really at all and it you know those are the things yeah. that maybe are good to try and there's to, also like things that get accidentally yeah. different because you yeah, know, the exactly. technology of exactly. the early days were not allowing for like uh, encapsulation of style and then like suddenly you have a right. style leaking and then like the button is like wider than it should be yeah. and it was not intended but nobody re remembers that it was yeah. not intended and it's just like the way it looks now right and then in that and that works okay if you have you know 10 people working on it or whatever if you have 100 people working on it those people aren't going to know that context have that in, be able to have that in their heads whatever and so it's like yeah setting yourself up for that kind of like growth is really important yeah, absolutely. So something that we've alluded to already is that this was sort of a, a bottom up grassroots effort. There was no leadership saying, go create a solid design system that's going to be a requirement for us to scale and have a solid UX. Uh, it's not not really the, the way that it worked. So uh, Derek, can you tell us a little bit about how this emerged as a grassroots effort? Yeah, I mean, it was like, it was, it was, a, it was a group of people who were like, like I said before, you know, thinking this is going to be important in sort of a, a um, in the trenches kind of like, you know, uh, working on this stuff day to day standpoint and saying like, OK, we, we need to figure out how to get buy in for this sort of future endeavor. And like I said before, maybe probably lesson learned, we could frame things differently and that sort of thing. But, you know, we, we, we sort of had to sell this idea, sell it upward throughout the company and say like, hey, you know, we, we think this is going to be important and here's why and sort of, you know, uh, make small inroads and, and say like, okay, you know, uh, here's what we want to do uh, as a small first step. And then we're going to show how it's valuable. And then, you know, sort of uh, at a, at a peer level or like a, a, a flat level, other people who are working on this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's front end engineers or designers, you know, start to get them on board and sh say like, okay, like we're building this stuff. You start to use it. Look, it makes your job easier. It makes, you know, a, for a better end user experience across the, the platform as it exists right now. So those people become your champions and then those people who say like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm bought in on this. And then they, you know, someone new joins their team and they sort of like spread the idea of this and say like, hey, this is the new way that we're going to try to do things. And then that's how you sort of like incrementally sell the idea upward, I think, or at least in our case. Um, and again, some companies, it's the other way around. And, and then I'm sure that comes with a different set of challenges in the other direction. But with us, it was like, I, I think there was a, a lot of concern or maybe not concern, but we paid a lot of attention of attention to like this idea of, of, of not falling into the trap of the lowest common denominator, where like, I th it is easy when you try to go and you try to take all these different things that have been expressed from a design standpoint, especially, um, and bring them together and make decisions about what's gonna be the canonical version of this or that. It's easy to fall into the trap of like, like making things consistent for the sake of being consistent, but not really understanding why you're doing that. And then having those choices regress your design output and your your sort of the user experience to like a lower common denominator than if you hadn't tried to consolidate those things in the first place. And like that absolutely is not a good outcome. Like that's a negative outcome. You shouldn't do it at all if that's going to happen. And so we really want to pay attention to that and try to like, you know, message the idea that we were paying attention to that too. And I think that, you know, frankly, is a, is a, is a valuable thing and it helped us. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's something that you both have uh, mentioned to me in the past is, is the importance of the creation of what you call the the front end yeah. guild. And some of you in the audience may be familiar with uh, guilds already, but briefly to define them, it's sort of a, a cross team unit that is long lived. Uh, so the idea is to bring knowledge and share knowledge across multiple teams to uh, make sure that something is at, at the forefront, people are thinking about it, but also being thoughtful about how you're thinking about it. I know that sounds a bit redundant, but it's a great way to identify and enable your early champions and your advocates. And I think Datadog, if you look at it, is historically been a bit more back-end focused. The original customers were more back-end operational folks trying to get their logs and their metrics consolidated, visualized, and alerted on. And from a founder perspective too, that was sort of the background of, of the two founders of, of the company. So this was a bit of a way to create a space for people thinking about design and, and front end. Um, and I think they have different concerns and Vincent, you have thoughts about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it also represents the state of the art um, of web technologies, because when I, uh, when I arrived, um, a, a lot of the code had been written by what we would refer to now as full stack people. We were just like writing code and then like making the web page that was working with it. And um, 
making a guild of front end people that were actually dedicated front end engineers that had been in the industry already that knew how we wanted to work is also a way for us to advocate for hey this is this is how front end people work to our back end people and so like explaining that like we actually will share the code right like very often back end people will just share their service their service as a one thing right like you reuse my proxy and it like this comes in this goes out and there's that's it um <clears throat> it's like a black box in front end we want to share code in a way that's like of course, like it's the same button on the same on different pages. It's going to be the same code underneath the hood. Um, so sharing and, and reusing code is something that you do that is like very different from um, what what you did in in back end and what you did back in the days. I, I think one of the things that is really cool uh, and probably helped get some attention on. on uh, for these early adopters and champions, <laughs> get people interested is the awesome swag. And someone on my team even mentioned this when I told them that I was working on a design systems episode with you guys and said, oh, you should find the t-shirt because that was still one of the coolest t-shirts that's been made at, at Datadog. So I don't know if you guys have extras, but I'd, I'd love to get one. But uh, I love this logo. <laughs> I, I love this approach. And I love the idea of just, you know, rewarding people for being interested and getting them excited about things. Yeah. Uh, the logo came first. You can. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so it was like a uh, the sort of original founding designer of Datadog, um, uh, whose name is John. Like designed this logo for some other thing. It was not not for the design system necessarily. Um, some other internal fun thing, and uh, I like sort of shamelessly stole it because I was like, this is really cool. It was the natural like <laughs> progression of like using the word guild, like front end guild. And then like using the little wizards emoji yeah, and then exactly. eventually like having this um exactly this illustration and then like getting the the backronym yeah uh, exactly. in place yeah exactly and it's like it has a sun and a moon and it's like one of the first things we did with the design system was like re release dark mode and it, so it's like it all it's kind of came together very nicely but yeah you can't underestimate the power of swag and stickers and things like that for like grassroots uh grassroots efforts, snowballing. It's pretty important, actually. Awesome. And then I think another way that the team was able to overcome a lot of the constraints and actually produce something effective and iterative early on was the fact that there was a strong cross-functional team. You know, there were there was communication between front-end engineering and the design team. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, of course, like um, you need people that are interested in doing the work, right? Like they that are passionate about doing it. And when I was um, early working on, on APM and Derek was my designer on APM, we would sit at different corners of the office. And um, like there's this weird thing that is design handoff, which is like, okay, I designed this and then like you just go implement it. And I'm, I want more collaborative way approach yeah. to design, which is like, hey, like, I need you to tell me like, how does it ellipses? How does it rescale? Like how many of things do you imagine? Maybe we could do this instead. Maybe I can propose you some UI that you didn't think about. And so I would go and like sit next to him um, in the design corner or like be on my knees next to the desk. <laughs> so much so that like the K who is a design manager here um, bought a stool for me to sit next to Derek and like uh, start the uh, still start the, the collaboration in a, in a seated way. <laughs> but it's but it's true. And I think it's like it's it's just the idea of, yeah, working really closely in that way and it, treating design and front end as sort of um, just, you know, not separate things, but the same like two different things on the same continuum. It was really important for us. And I think really important just generally in, in product design for like software like Datadog um, because you can design whatever you want but like if you don't understand or at least have some idea about how it's going to get implemented how you know front-end engineers are going to use that component that you've designed or that you've spec'd out or whatever it's, it's probably not going to work the way you expect and it's not going to you know sort of cover the cases that you that it probably should and you're not going to understand you know enough about about um, all of that, you know, all of the ways it's going to be used as you should. And so I think this is really important and it, and it goes both ways too, because, you know, Vincent and, uh, you know, uh, 
basically all of the engineers we've ever had on our team on our uh, it ended up being called design ops now it's called design systems team um, they're all really design minded and like sort of keeping that culture has been a big focus for us throughout you know ever since we started the, the, the team several years ago of you know engineers who really care about design who are going to participate in design reviews who are not going to just think of their sort of domain as purely like writing the code and, and you know shipping and deploying it but you know it, it their job extends into the design part of things and then all the designers on our team have you know have a strong technical background and they can understand how the components get made what it takes to document them well how front end engineers are going to consume them um and all that kind of thing and i think that's like maybe the biggest secret to like you know whatever success we have had is is that you know mindset yeah well, so we've talked a bit about the constraints and a bit of how the team was set up to overcome some of those. And uh, now it's time to talk about what actually happened. What are the results of all of that work and that culture that you managed to create? The identifying champions, the front end guild, the bottom up focus. Uh, so you mentioned the the design ops team, yep. the creation of the design ops team. Um, I think it's one of the more interesting teams at Datadog just because it it is, I believe, the only team that has front-end engineers and designers in the same place. But uh, is there anything interesting that the audience should know about the design ops team? Yeah, I mean, I think like, so design, and I just to clarify, designers and engineers, like front-end engineers work closely together throughout Datadog. But just like, yeah, our team is especially sort of specific because we're like literally on on the same the same team. Um, but yeah, we started small. Like we were, it was, you know, uh, two of us and then um, a third engineer um, named Nadir. Shout out to Nadir for, he was on our team for a long time. Um, and, you know, we, we gradually added, you know, some designers, some front end engineers. Um, another thing that we, that we, um, that we did and still do and, and did from pretty early on, sort of along the lines of the front end guild, but when our team was formalized was a concept of rotations, um, which I think also was really cool. And it was like a thing where someone from, you know, a different product design team or a different, you know, uh, engineer on a different engineer on a different product team would come and do a, a rotation on our team for like a week or two weeks sometimes. Um, at the beginning, even we sort of like required all when we were much, much smaller on the product design side, uh, we re like required all product designers to do a rotation on design ops uh, once, a, however many you know months or whatever. Um, and it was an idea of just making sure that giving people an exposure to this sort of like platform thinking, you know, the things that we're building and designing are used all across Datadog. Um, and so it just like helped really reinforce that that idea that what we were you know whatever you're designing or you're building on the front end of Datadog, it's ultimately not just for your one like sort of immediate use case. It's going to be used. And exposed to a lot of different people and i think that was really um another uh, sort of really really beneficial thing as we were getting started so uh one of the big thing that i think uh is the hallmark of success is also the fact that we really or i i, I personally wanted to make sure that we were gaining trust yeah. as we were building the team and like making yep. things bigger so um helping people like realize like manage their goals with the design system was very important to me so like i wanted to make sure that we were on top of like answering slack messages yeah. because you know if you have a problem with a design system and you don't get help then you abandon the design system and you're like okay those people don't want to help me so i'm just gonna do my thing like i can't you can't do whatever yourself <laughs> like all this stuff we're building anyone can make it themselves yeah, so it's well, like of course. Yeah. but you know like um and it's it's also like a way to expose ourselves back to what are the problems yeah. that prob product is facing? What are the things that are difficult to use that are not baked in the design system? Nadir used to say like the components needs to be like battery included. Yeah. And like sometimes when you start designing a component or, or uh, making the properties for a component, like you can't make the batteries yet because you don't know how it's going to be used. So having this really like forefront like I'm, we are here for you. We will respond to your Slack in like a timely manner. Was like the most uh, important thing for me. And that's at least still part of what we do every day. You know, like we, we we do an onboarding every week for new people who are joining Datadog, and we say like, if you take one thing away from this, it's that like communication is the most important thing. So yeah. like, come to us if you have questions. If you have what you know, whatever you might have, come talk to us about it. Like we're here to help you. But like none of that works without communication. Like in the end, it's it's. In the end, it's like human problems more so than technical problems in a lot of, or not problems, but yeah. human considerations make this stuff work or not work. So 
Yeah. So one thing that I think is a result of the great design system you've created is a very opinionated philosophy, a well-defined philosophy and approach to how you think about things. And when I was taking a look at the Druid, Druid style guide, this is the piece that really stood out to me. The design system is a means to an end. The system works for us. We don't work for it. And you both alluded to this a little bit already, talking about how you don't want to be constrained, don't want to feel like the design choices that have been made are lowest common denominator that you, you have to use. Um, but I think also uh, there's there's more to it than that. This is kind of the subtext here is that you can create a great design system, but that does not mean that you have a good UX at all. Yeah, exactly. It's like, right, it's a means to an end. Like it says here, it's 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 the building blocks of, you know, the the small decisions or the, the components that appear all throughout the, you know, the app and, and the, uh, in many different places. But like it's still up to people to to compose those and put those together, um, and right you can use you know you can make a, a page or a layout or a screen or a workflow or whatever it is and you can use like all components from Druids, but just because you do that doesn't mean that it's good or doesn't mean that it's like solving the, the sort of user's problem in the right way or that it's you know addressing the right use case. Um, you can do all that stuff and, and not thoughtfully compose it and sort of just you know paint by numbers and come up with something that like. Yeah, it, it might use consistent components or consistent patterns, but it's not going to feel necessarily, you know, usable or familiar to users, um, you know, just because you use things from the design system. And I think the other side of that is like, is we should be, we, we try not to have like a dogmatic adherence to everything. You know, there are certain things that certain fundamental decisions that it's like, okay, we're not going to like question this on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not like you're going to, you're, you're going to go, you know, you're a designer, you're designing something. You're going to use the, the font, the typeface that we use throughout the data web app. You're going to use the, the sort of baseline color palette for our, you know, interactive states and whatever, things like that. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's not a good use of people's time to sort of question those all the time. But you can question the way, you know, certain things have been, you know, expressed at a component level or, you know, oh, the way that this component, this drop down works it doesn't seem like it's the best way we could have done this from a UX perspective. Maybe we could rethink that. And that happens all the time. People come to us and we're always talking about that, communicating. Um, and just because it exists, it doesn't mean that like it's set in stone forever, I guess is the real takeaway. This, the whole point is that this stuff can evolve and we can make it in a way that it's, you know, uh, the, the, the components, the patterns, the documentation for it is in one spot. And it lets us evolve it more easily because we know what we're dealing with. We know how people are using it. We know, you know, what you, new use cases are coming in. Um, but it's the, it's the flexibility to let us, you know, think about that stuff. I think yeah. that's really yeah. important. And I think you've, you've articulated this a, a bit more with some of these other parts that are included in this design systems philosophy. Uh, you know, that obviously one of the goals is to make design faster, more confident. Uh, you don't want people to spend that time worrying about what font they should use or what the color palette should be. Those choices have, have been made and they've been thoughtfully made so that people can focus on solving the real problems that customers are uh, are interested in having solved for them. Yes. Um, and this is, this is something that you, you spoke to as well. Uh, you know, it's consistency is, uh, only a means to an end, uh, predictability is the payoff that makes a more usable product. Uh, again, focusing on the end user, on the customer, on meeting their needs, making sure that if a certain sort of widget works one way in one part of the system, that they don't have to learn how a widget that accomplishes the same task works uh, works somewhere else. Yeah. Or if you go and you want to make one that works somewhere, some other way, have be able to say why and like do it for a reason and say, you know, I understand that people are used to using it this way here. But I think it's still important enough that we do it differently here for this reason. That's okay. Yeah. And, you know, that's a, that's a totally fair basis for, you know, exploration and conversation. And yeah, I think that's uh, one of the decision, like one of the technical decision that we have baked in that was, that is also like somewhat helping us be a hub of, uh, of knowledge is that we do not version our design system. It is shipped with the app. So meaning that if we make a change to the design system, if we make a breaking change, we need to go fix those product so that they work still. Mm -hmm. And so we have the knowledge about how are the components being used? What is the use case that they're filling? And so that helps us guide people into making their design solution 
a very much like a coherent, cohesive for the end user. Yeah, and and the only other thing I would add to that is that we're not, we really, really try not to be in the business of um, building and designing things for like use cases that don't exist yet. We try to be like, we try to make the components and, and the patterns sort of theoretically flexible so that they could be extended to sort of arbitrarily new use cases, but we don't actually make them support arbitrary use cases until they come up concretely. And so it gives us a handle on like how people are using things, what they're using them to do now. And then if someone comes when they have a new use case, we can think about, okay, we can extend this component or make this, you know, pattern uh, different or better or, you know, do a different thing. Um, but if you just sort of say, oh, we're going to like support any possible thing from the beginning, then you, you're not really doing anything. You're not really yeah. making any choice or decision and yeah. it's not really valuable. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that speaks to this, this uh, final point when it comes yep. to the philosophy of the design system, right? You, you have to give space for those new emerging things, those new use cases, those new UX requirements. And so uh, you should take advantage of the work already done, but seek out new designs and solutions to push the platform forward. And part of that is, like you said, you want to focus on the concrete, not the theoretical. So you won't be able to design everything ahead of time, but you have to make space in the system for those things to be designed when the time is right. Yeah, and it goes hand in hand with like delivering something that works today and making it better. Yeah. Like maybe, you know, the first UI that like you do for your new product is not the best, but you get to ship something that works with, you know, basic components, basic UI that will allow customer to give you feedback. And then that will feed into your next round of design. And the next time you like come back to it, you will make a better UI. And maybe down the road, somebody from another product will want to integrate that. And this is when we'll talk about making that part of the system. Okay. Yeah. And you know, I think all of this work has actually resulted in real results and, and enabling other teams to move quickly. You know, at the number of products and features on the Datadog platform has expanded a lot since you set out on this adventure a long time ago. And uh, one example that you both gave me when we were preparing for this is the the team and the product that was acquired that eventually became uh, the foundation for synthetics. And they were able to get up and running and get the look and feel and UX of a Datadog product applied to what they were working on uh, very, very quickly. So all of that stuff actually does matter and did make meaningful change as things scaled up. Yeah. And it's like, I think it gives you, yeah, f flexibility as, you know, a business, um, and not, not to get too far to my lane here, but like, it gives you like business flexibility. And that's like, you can say, oh, we, we, you know, we acquired this company and like, uh, integrating the front end part of things is not going to be the big challenge here. It's going to be, you know, maybe other, other things are going to be challenging other systems or whatever, but like, you know, we have a pretty clear path forward and like a, a track record of being able to say, okay, we can fold this in to Datadog. And like you said, make it feel like, feel familiar to Datadog users using familiar Datadog patterns. Um, and I think that's like, yeah, that's like a pretty valuable thing. So. Cool. So I know that you did a bunch of work and created a bunch of tools to enable ease of use and to make it so that adopting everything was straightforward and not, uh, as you mentioned, people could go build things themselves. So you want to make sure that you pave the roads and make it easy for them to make the right choice and use the design system. So I, I want to just touch on some of those things that are that are an outcome. Uh, we talked about the fact that you can go check out some of the docs and the component library at druids.datadoghq.com. Uh, they're really cool. I think it's it's awesome to be able to see all of the different components. It's easily searchable. It it works very, very well. But uh, one of the things that I think is is uh, is super cool is this Druid's loop that's available to people working on stuff internally. They can hit Command-K uh, from any page, basically, and pull this up and see uh, what is that widget? What part of the design system does it come from? Uh, where can I find it in the style guide? Where can I find the code? How can I see the designs in Figma that it's based on, uh, which is super awesome. Um, and I think Derek, you mentioned that this came from a hackathon. Yeah, yeah, which I think is just like another cool part of the data culture. We do we do hackathons um, throughout the whole engineering um, org at Datadog. I guess it's twice a year uh, now, and. Yeah, this just came out of, we were like, wouldn't this be really cool to be able to sort of like go in the Datadog web app, inspect, you know, turn on something, inspect anything and tie it back to the design system. And um, yeah, we built this for a hackathon. Shout out to Benjamin, who was uh, 
who was I think he was an intern on our team at the time. He's now he's now he's like a seasoned a seasoned veteran of our team for for several years. But I think this is like one of the first the first hackathon things that he that he ever did, and and he and I worked on this. And um, it's pretty cool, and it's it's also like a really good onboarding thing. We have a bunch of these little like helper things that tie together Druids with the rest of the code base and the rest of the app. So you can like say to somebody new who's joining Datadog as a designer, as a front end engineer, like, hey, go go use Datadog. You know, you're, as you're getting familiar with the product itself, it's you know very big product. You can do a lot of different things. Turn on the command K, I mean the um, uh, Druid's loop, and uh, get a feel for like how the stuff is composed. You know how how the the UI is built, sort of how it's layered and the different things that that make it up. Um, and it just gives people like a really, I think helpful look into that kind of thing. And, and it's cool, like honestly, I think it's a, it's just like a cool feature to be able to show people. Um, people get excited about it. And uh, I don't know, you can't underestimate like just things that seem cool too, I think. So, you know. Yeah, that's absolutely. Uh, and this, this is something I, I've never heard of a similar thing at uh, other companies. Maybe people have done it, but uh, maybe more will be inspired by this and take it away and try and implement something uh, on their own. Uh, within the documents too, I think something that's really cool is this sort of sandbox mode that you can enter for any component, these editable playgrounds. So if you're interested in creating a button, you can mess around with the source right there, see what the results of changing those different properties will be. Um, and then something that I think is really awesome is that you can link back to the state of the sandbox that you've been playing around with. So again, just making it easy for people to play around with, discover what's possible. Uh, and I think that probably goes a long way to making sure that people don't feel limited by what they have to work with in terms of components. Yeah, and I think it also makes people feel like they're more active participants. So like, it makes people feel more sort of like directly invested in the in the system. They can go and edit this stuff directly. Maybe they, they're like trying to figure out how to use something, they can't quite get it. They can link to the sandbox. They can say, "Hey, here, here's what I'm trying to do." And we say, "Oh, actually, like that's a bug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to open the PR and fix it." And it like it, it also you know yeah. when people are able to do that, it makes them more personally invested. So it's just like nice feedback. That's, it's like so much easier to share a snippet of code yeah, yeah. about just one component and say like this is how it should work, this is how I want it to work, etc. Than like you know going on a branch and like pulling the product and like I don't know this product. Where do I click to trigger your bug, etc. Yeah, exactly. So, Cool. And then there's also this uh, command line affordance for scaffolding. If you want to try and create a, a new component, kind of get things set up in, in the right way, make sure that all the guardrails are in place so that when you start working on that, uh, you're doing it in a way that's going to make it easy to integrate into the design system. Yeah, there's like a... You know, a lot of the decisions that we took when uh, when we met as the Farm Guild uh, were also like outside of the scope of the design system. And so uh, organization of the code, the way we name things, what technology we use under the hood, like all of those got encoded in the same time into like the foundation of front end of digital. And so all of those tools that we built for um, the style guide, we like make them so that people inside of the product could use them. And so the idea behind this um, uh, scaffolding of components is that if you scaffold a component for a design system, it's the exact same thing as scaffolding a component inside of your app. You want to have something that is made, you want to have a style, you want to have some documentation, and so you can reuse that and make sure in the end that like your code is made in a way that it will be consumable by other products. Yeah, we have this idea of like basically Druids is the sort of foundational layer of everything. And then, yeah, different product teams build their own sort of mini design systems yeah. or toolkits or whatever you want to call it. Um, on top of that, and then those things get reused throughout the the Datadog, you know, web app because it's so sort of cross connected and everything. And so when they, when they, um, when they they can take advantage of these tools too, and they, yeah, exactly, build their code or build their stuff with the same sort of practices, and then everything just works the same way everywhere, and it's expected. So it's from a technical standpoint. Cool. I think it's interesting to just kind of step back and see how far things have come. You know, from 2010 when Datadog was founded to 2014 when the company became early adopters of React as a front-end framework to 2016 when APM became uh, the first new sort of feature that was going to solve some different problems in terms of UX than what had traditionally been solved. 2018 when you started 
formalizing things into a de design system, resulting in 2019 in the creation of the design ops team. And then uh, just last year, almost two years now, I guess, uh, publishing Druid's docs publicly. And uh, Derek, you mentioned that when it was time to publish these publicly, there was a lot of top-down interest in getting that done, um, yeah. which to me is is awesome. That just shows how it came for full circle from grassroots having to manage up to get buy-in to they're fully bought in and leadership believes in the results of this work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We had, you know, some some people in leadership and say, oh, when when are we going to publish the, you know, when are we going to publish the 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 style guide live? It's cool. We, you know, we published it. Um it, it was like on the front page of Hacker News. A lot of people had, you know, comments about it, but it was like generally positive. Um, which was which was, you know, people like uh, it, it sort of reflected positively on us on data dog and that was really cool to see. Um and yeah, and, and I think just sharing that stuff publicly is, you know, it's not open source, but like you can see at least the way we've approached a lot of these decisions that we're talking about. And I don't know, hopefully it's it's helpful if you check it out. Awesome. So I think we're reaching the end of, of the program here. Uh, there is still open Q&A. So if anyone has questions, you still have a chance to get those submitted. But I think, you know, it's always important to leave people with some key takeaways, some concrete thoughts, some lessons learned from all of the that hard work and all of that experience. So um, I don't know, uh, Derek, do you want to do you want to speak through these real quickly? Yeah, I mean, and I think we've sort of touched on all of these already at different points in this um, discussion. But yeah, like, to me, yeah, don't try to do the whole thing up front, you know, figure out what the what the real use cases are. And like, basically, what the 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 actual customer and user value is. And I guess that's sort of in the last point here too, but figure out what that is. You know, don't try to sort of um, sell the idea for doing this on uh, just like the technical sort of benefits. You have to connect it to, uh, to like end user value or else it doesn't really <laughs> matter in the end. You know, we're selling a product here and like, you know, uh, that's the most important thing at the end of the day. Um, and then from the sort of internal sort of other, other end of the spectrum, figure out who your champions are. I talked about this before too, but like, you know, a grassroots thing like this, you know, really takes, I, I think, focus on like, you know, knowing who is gonna support what you're doing, reaching out to them, trying to bring them, you know, more and more into the fold of what you're doing. Um, so like I said before, so they, they can go and they can talk to their team, their, you know, sort of share what you're doing with their product teams and then what you're doing can kind of grow and be reused in more and more places organically um, throughout the company. And then and then the last point is just like, talk about what you're doing. I think, you know, it's easy to be shy about it. Um, but like, I remember when we were really starting Druids, I would send like an email out to like our whole product and engineering and design list. That would be like, you know, we released a new component. It was like yeah. at that level of granularity <laughs> you know, we made an action tray component or something. And it was, it was, you know, we tried to make the most fun and have like a funny subject line or whatever. And just the act of doing that, like put what we were doing in front of people and made them just think about that fact. And, yeah. you know, I it's, think no it's, progress. It's, it's also stuff. about being part of the ecosystem. So like being part of the life of the front end engineer, mm -hmm, being exactly. part of like the people who discuss like how we build things. Um, and, and let the results of your work speak for itself as well, because I think that um, people will be the best advocate once they have used it, right. and they will be right. like happy with it, right? They will say, "Oh my God, I'm so happy this exists! I like I put this together in three days." Right. Um, and so, like, it's it's very important to be um, understand understanding like the the whole picture and uh, be positioning yourself in a way that's like really helping. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like the most valuable when somebody who isn't you says like, Hey, I use this thing that you made to tell someone else about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, that's even better than you going and telling, telling them yourself to, to, to use it. So yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, that brings us to the end of the scheduled programming, but uh, don't leave yet because we do have a, a few questions. The first question, uh, how how do you go about creating new patterns? So when some team or some product identifies a need for something that currently isn't reflected in the design system, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, this is like the communication thing that I was talking about. We say, look, if you have a new pattern, a new idea, just even an inkling of something that you would like the Druids to do that it doesn't do right now, 
um, come talk to us like as early as you can. Just just we, we, we try not to have like a formal thing where we're like, you know, we have a committee that meets and we'll like vote on changes. We really try not to do that. We try to make it much more um, fluid and like flexible. Um, and I think we do a pretty good job of that. I think the only other thing I would say about that is like, I think it's easy people sometimes inherently, you know, if you're a systems team or a platform team, I think some people have just like an inherent um, idea that like you're going to be the gatekeepers of stuff. And sometimes you do have to say no. And you have to say like, Hey, this idea that you have, like, we don't want to do it and that's okay. And we, you know, we can back that up with reasoning and it's really hard to document like the app. The, if the you thing. decided not to do something, it's really hard to document that. You can point to documentation of why you did do something. Um, but anyway, someone comes to us, you know, we have a, we, our team has like a, a triage meeting every day. We go over the requests that people have made. We talk about, you know, Hey, maybe we can just, a lot of times it's like, yeah, we can just like add a new prop for what they want to do into mm -hmm. the component, or we can like add a new variant for the design of this, you know, button or whatever it is. Um, yeah, and I think but it's sometimes a, it's a bigger thing, and then we have a conversation, and usually it's productive. It's also important. Like I, I think there's a difference between like the beginnings of the design yeah. systems team and and when we had few components, right. and when like like obviously this we should put it in the design system. Right. We 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 don't have enough hands yet. Um, but uh, sometimes it's also like you know more about like making sure that people who are like the younger designer who understand like that they, they need to understand like is this a system thing or is it like just a thing for my product okay. and they might not be seasoned enough to recognize the difference and making sure that we guide them into oh like this is just going to be inside of product x for a while and then and then we'll see if somebody else is um wants to use that and and we'll make that part of the design system later on and we can guide them about like how to design it so that it's generic to whatever it contains Yep. But um, you know the new the new uh, patterns uh, don't just emerge, right? Like they've been they've been anybody can have an idea, right. and then like where do we do what do we do with that idea? Well, and I think that's like the other uh, interesting thing about about our team or any platform team really is that like by definition you're working on things that are sort of across the platform, so you see a lot of stuff, you sort of by nature of what you're doing, understand, or at least are exposed to a lot of how the, the platform works, what what different things happen and what use cases are supported in different types of, you know, in different products throughout data data. And so then you can, um, I think the act of like talking through a new idea that somebody has, that, that somebody comes to us, um, the act of doing that often helps other people say like, oh, maybe like, I didn't even realize that we were trying to do this new, this, you know, I didn't realize that we had this use case in this other place. Um, because I was only working on my specific product. And so I think it's like a two-way thing too. It helps, it helps designers, it helps engineers like, you know, be exposed to more of the, the platform too, when they have to think about, you know, how are they gonna extend a component or a pattern? Um, and that ultimately is good because like, like I said, the whole point of Datadog is that it's this platform and it's this interconnected thing. So the more that people are, you know, uh, designing uh, with that in mind is, is a good thing and, and developing with that in mind, so. Yeah. Awesome. A uh, couple more questions. Uh, so someone's interested in understanding what some of the tensions between front end engineering and design might be and how you overcome those. And, and we talked a little bit about having strong cross-functional teams, uh, the design ops team having both disciplines within it, those sorts of things. Uh, but do you have any other thoughts about this topic? Do you have an intention with a front end engineer? Right? <laughs> um, yeah, I think for um, a lot of the, so for instance, we, we consider the code, the source of truth for design, right? So like we're saying basically whatever is in production about the design system is what is the reference. Um, and so, you know, the, the Figma and whatever screenshot you might have in uh, in your little portfolio, those will age, but the code that is shipped in production will will be like the source of truth. Um, so for for front end people, it's it's very uh, deterministic. There's like you know, those are the components. This is what it, how it goes. This is what I can do with it. Um, whereas like I feel like it's very easy for a designer to um, inject more subtlety, right? That there's like a billion way you can do something in design. 
and um, understanding and having the tooling inside of the design tool inside of Figma, having the UI kit inside of Figma that reflects exactly how the code behaves, having the same props, having like the same yeah. name for things and like things that just align, things that just like populate with data. Having this and thanks Jeno for doing this uh, with us for so many years is like removing so much of the ambiguity of shipping design to code because we're talking the same language. Yeah, we're saying yeah. button is the button. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very important. And something that we had talked about in our preparation but didn't make it into the slides, but you know, you, you, the idea that design changes are not often reflected in the code itself, but they're very, very impactful and apparent to customers and end users. Versus, it's the other. The other way is is true for front end engineering, right? The changes are very obvious in the code. There's commit trails. There's all of that but they may be completely transparent to, to the users. So I think there's a little bit of tension in terms of uh, what's obvious and what's not obvious as well. Yeah, and, and it's easy, right. And so like along those lines, it's, it's easy to document the history of, ch of changes in code, right? Because there's a trail for that and you can sort of look back and you can see, oh, you can sort of recapture the state of something relatively easily at a given point in time. And for design, it's like, it's a lot more and squishy than that or nebulous and it's and it's also like it's more subjective in a lot of ways and so you know um you could say you know here's how we had to design or we approached something from like a pattern standpoint you know a few years ago and one person might describe that one way and another person might describe the same reality but with a totally different lens and they might you know it's with code it's much more concrete it's like you can see it. It's right there. That's right. Here's how it works. We talk about tech debt we never talk about design debt. Yeah 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 um but there are definitely like things that have disappeared from uh, the UI and the design. And like, we like made the choice to like retire um, mm -hmm. some elements, some shadows that like just made us look like 2012, you know, like at some point, like there are patterns in the UI that like have a flair of, uh, mm -hmm. of old style. And so you want to move away from that too. Yep. And then I think our final question, you know, in, 2019, when the design ops team started to now, there's been quite a few people added to the team at Datadog. I think the the balance of designers and front-end engineers has changed a lot. How has the system evolved during that time to support that new scale that we operate at? Yeah, I mean, this is like a really good question. Uh, and I think, frankly, like, so, you know, based on the history of, of how everything started, we've been really, really sort of, we've been techni technically focused. We've skewed very technical with the design system, with our documentation. The idea of code being the source of truth, all this data, data dog is like, you know, it's sort of a developer tools company. Um, it's for technical users, or at least historically has been. Um, and so all of the stuff in the design system and the documentation of it has skewed very technical over the years. And I think as we've grown to a design team of, I don't know, like 90 or so at this point, um, we've realized that the, the way we sort of talk about our, our, our design patterns and the way we talk about, you know, best practices for, um, you know, building our UI uh, has needed to evolve. We realized that that's needed to evolve to like better sort of meet designers where they are, better uh, talk about things like using sort of language that designers are familiar with, do a better job of exposing certain things in, in design tools like Figma, which is our primary tool, like you said, um, and sort of uh, just make things more accessible to designers instead of assuming uh, maybe implicit, you know, sometimes we implicitly had the idea that like designers are going to be uh, t very technical and understand some of these decisions and understand some of this stuff without having to explain it through like a sort of designer perspective. And, and we're really working on that. And I don't think we've sort of solved that in it by any means necessarily, but it's something that we're like definitely paying attention to now. Um, and trying to sort of bring designers into the fold. It, it, now that we're much bigger, you know, being more intentional about that um, and making them feel like, in the end, it's like the system is everybody's design system. Like we, 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 we maybe started it or we maintain it on a day-to-day -day basis or whatever, but like we all should feel investment in it and that's very important. But we have to like be ex more explicit about that as we grow with new people, you know, and, and um, and I think that's like a really important thing. And it's like something we pay a lot of attention to. So 
Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think that brings us to the end of Datadog on Design Systems. Vincent, Derek, thank you very much for your time, for sharing your story. For everyone out there watching, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you on the next episode.